Hi, I'm Mickey Lustig, and today we're going to talk about flexible MRI coils. My group receives funding from GE Healthcare. I'm a founder, board member, and stock owner of InkSpace Imaging, a company that commercializes the flexible printed coil technology, which came out of UC Berkeley. MRI receiver coils are near field antenna. They are designed to maximize the signal at the lawnmower frequency. While many designs exist, the use of array of elements is key for improving image SNR and parallel imaging acceleration. While smaller coils have limited penetration in comparison to volume coils, they also pick up much less noise from the sample, thus increasing SNR. So to maximize SNR, proximity of the coil elements to the body is key. Hence the need for flexibility. Flexibility allows you to get closer to the patient. To gain both SNR and coverage, arrays of elements must be used. The number of elements have dramatically increased since multiple coils also offer imaging speed through parallel imaging acceleration. To cover different body parts, manufacturers have designed many different arrays for the different applications. But bodies also come with different sizes. And it is impossible to equip every single clinic with all possible coil types and fits. So often a coil would misfit some patients. And unfortunately, this is very common for the pediatric population. This is one of my favorite papers out of MGH. To demonstrate the importance of fit, they constructed dedicated head coils for different age patients all the way from neonates to seven-year-old. Let's look at the results on the right. If you put a patient with a small head in a four-year-old coil, the SNR would be significantly better than scanning the same patient in an adult coil. But on the left side, you see the most remarkable result. Scanning a neonate in a neonate size coil will have negligible G-factor penalty when accelerating the scan ninefold while scanning the same patient in an adult coil would result in 400% reduction in SNR, effectively making the image useless. So for coils, size does matter. To enable fit to the patient's size, flexibility is the key since flexible coils can naturally adapt to geometry. For example, here's a beautiful work out of the Polytechnique Montreal group showing a head coil that can adapt to different patient sizes, effectively replacing the need for five separate, separate coils. Hopefully I convince you that flexible coils are useful. Now let's talk about some of the issues, challenges, and technologies that go into designing and making these coils. So let's first start with what's inside a coil. Coil is a loop that is inductively coupled to the sample. The EMF generated in the loop is passed through a transmission line, amplified, and then digitized by the system. To maximize the signal, capacitors are added to create resonance at the lawnmower frequency and match the impedance of the coil to the transmission line. However, in this configuration, during transmit, the receive coil will also capture the immense, immense transmit energy. This poses severe risks to both the equipment and the patient. To mitigate with this and block currents during transmission, a resonant tank is used to create a high impedance on the coil. This coil detuning circuitry is typically actively driven by biasing a PIN diode. Now regulators define a single fault condition as a condition in which a single means for reducing risk is defective. This situation can occur when the coil is left unconnected and the PIN diode is not biased. Therefore, for safety, cross diodes must be used. In some cases, a fuse must also be added as well to mitigate for the situation where neither the active nor the passive blocking are not working correctly. Let's quickly talk about regulations. In order to market coils to be used on patients, 
manufacturers must meet the many regulator specifications. Some are listed here. For example, in a surface heating test, the temperature of patient-facing coil parts must not exceed 41 degrees Celsius. Another, relating to electromagnetic compatibility, says that the distance of 4 mm must be maintained between any conductor and the patient. Now, there's a good reason for it. In a recently published report on FDA adverse events over the past decade, the authors found that out of 1548 events, 138 of them were directly linked to heating events related to MRI coils. So this is a serious issue. Here's an example of one of the craziest tests coils have to pass under the IEC 60601 impact testing. Pay attention. To perform the test, simply drop a 500 gram steel ball from a height of 1.3 meters onto the top of your medical device. Now imagine what would happen to a ceramic capacitor, detuning circuit, PIN diodes, or RF trap under this test. While this device does not have to work after this test, it must remain safe under a single fault condition. So this is no wonder why coils look like they do. Heavy, armored devices. Still, manufacturers and researchers have successfully developed somewhat semi-flexible coils. These often use rigid PCBs and copper traces and leave room for hinges such that the coil can conform at least in one dimension. This approach is similar to having an armor. It is possible to move, but the armor is heavy and limits motion. As the Mandalorian would say, this is the way. But is this the way? Here are some commercial first generation flex coils. They are made of with flex PCBs. You can see the plastic cases protecting the vulnerable electronics, while flexible foam covers the elements. These coils can mostly lightly flex in one direction, but not in both. This limitation is the result of using conventional electronics and materials while complying with the regulations. To move into the next generation, we will explore several technologies and solutions that enable fully flexible coil arrays. These include new substrates and conductors, new flexible components, and new interface electronics. Copper is a great conductor. Replacing it with alternatives may increase the losses in the coil. Fortunately, the main source of noise in MRI comes from the subject itself. So this gives a leeway to using new materials, which may be less conductive without suffering from SNR loss. Since flexibility enables the coil element to get closer to the body and improve SNR, SNR loss due to conductor losses can sometimes be compensated by proximity. This is our own work, leveraging printing of silver inks onto very flexible plastic substrates to form coil arrays. First, the thin plastic substrate is loaded into a screen printer. A screen with a coil pattern is lowered onto the substrate. A conductive silver microflake ink is spread over the patterned opening in the screen and forced through onto the substrate below. Once printed, the substrate is removed and then heated, thus drying the ink and making a conductive foam. Capacitors are formed by printing traces on both sides of the substrate and using the substrate as a dielectric. While the substrate and inks are flexible, we'll still need to connect the traces and add the matching tuning and detuning circuitry. Unfortunately, sorting is out of the question for these type of materials. So in this example of the posterior portion of a 12 channel pediatric blanket array, we interface to the printed coil via a flex PCB bonded using conductive epoxy. To avoid any bulky component within the antenna portion, we move the matching detuning circuitry away from the coil, thus making the transmission line part of the coil. Here's the final product. We encapsulate the elements in Teflon. 
add fire resistant foam and encapsulate with child friendly cleanable fabric. The result is super light and flexible pediatric coil. With IRB approved protocol, we tested this coil on pediatric patients at Lucille Packard Children's Hospital at Stanford. The images show high SNR and excellent coverage on three months to five year olds. You can also see the coil on a two year old patient. Note that the respiratory bellows are on top of the coil, which is extremely unusual, and this is because the coil is so flexible. The top image is a UTE scan, which shows the signal from the respiratory bellows. Note that this orange curve is where the coil is. It is in close proximity to the body for maximum SNR. In a 20 patient usability study, we found that the flexible coil is preferred by everyone to the commercial 32 coil that is uh, used at Stanford. And the SNR of the images are similar. Flexible substrate can neatly conform to isometric surfaces, but cannot conform to any shape without wrinkling. This work out of Purdue uses a stretchable fabric with a thread conductor woven as a spring into the substrate. This enables the coil to conform better to arbitrary shapes, though the capacitors in this case remain rigid and discrete. Any changes in geometry can cause changes in resonance or coupling, and this is somewhat mitigated by the matching circuitry and preamplifier decoupling in this coil. This is from ATH Zurich Group. Here, they introduce a novel, non-toxic liquid metal encapsulated in silicon tube to enable the elements to flex. Interface is done through a copper insert and the coil elements are integrated in flexible textile. The conductivity of gallium indium is of course less than copper, but is still high enough to achieve body noise dominance. This, this one is also from ET8 Zurich, where they replaced the liquid metal with a very flexible and stretchable conductive elastomer. The matching circuitry and amplifier chosen in this work provides some flexibility for the change in matching conditions as the coil elements stretch. This can be used to see this kinematic study on the right. Now variable trim capacitors are often used by coil designers. They make it easy to tune and match without needing to solder and desolder rigid capacitors, which may not be possible when using novel conductors and substrates. This work is from our group to make a flexible variable capacitor. This capacitor is constructed with a series and parallel plate capacitance for rough and fine tuning. We use a low loss Pyrolex AP flexible PCB. Tuning is done by cutting or soldering traces on the capacitor, mimicking the use of a trim cap, but maintaining it flexible. The previous approaches required separate flexible substrates, flexible conductors, and flexible capacitors. All these can be found inherently built into transmission line resonators. This work out of NYU shows the use of coaxial transmission lines as coil elements. The resonance is controlled by the length of the wire, its width, and cuts that are made in the shield or inner conductor. This particular design also exhibits high impedance than traditional coils, and therefore the currents in the coil are reduced, thus reducing the coupling between elements as well as robustness to geometry changes. On the right, you can see a multi-channel hand coil with element woven into a glove. While the coil is very flexible, the electronics is not so much, which shows the importance of a holistic solution for flexible coils. Coaxial resonators are all the rage now, and rightfully so. On the left, you can see work from Vienna, where they implemented multi-turn, multi-gaps in the resonator to provide more flexibility in frequency and size. The elements are indeed very, very flexible. On the right is the work from Leiden. You can see a transmit-receive coaxial array 
using shielded coaxial transmission lines, demonstrating the possibility of using transmit as well for a flexible nuclear. The Leiden group in their paper showed a very nice analysis of the performance of these shielded coaxial coils. On the left, you can see the distribution of currents in the coil. Since the currents on the coaxial shields are very low, these coils end up being robust to changes in geometry as compared to traditional coils, making them better suitable for flexible applications. Our colleagues at Stanford have been collaborating with GE to test a new technology that uses wire loops with integrated on-coil amplifiers. These are also extremely flexible devices. The publications are quite cryptic in details, but some information can be found in the patent application. These coils, in addition to the interface electronics, are able to provide excellent isolation between elements as seen in the video. On the left, traditional coils are heavily coupled when getting close, but these air loops do not seem to exhibit much coupling at all. Now images on the right show excellent coverage and signal in accelerated 4D flow exams on a pediatric patient. Again, in a 20 patient study, the preference was towards the flexible coil. This indicates that flexibility is really needed for pediatric patients. With all the difficulties and challenges, it is encouraging to see the industry starting to move in the direction of ultimate flexibility. Here you can see several state-of-the-art blanket coils for adults and pediatric patients. These are definitely exciting times. The untold secret in the coil business is that most problems come from cabling. RF engineers spend most, spend most of the time routing cables and putting RF traps or balings to minimize parasitic coupling to elements and the body transmitter, as well as manage heating. This issue becomes a real nightmare as channel count increases. The coil element is not the only conductor which interacts with the transmit field. During transmit, very high currents can run on the shield of a coaxial transmission line, endangering the patient. To reduce these currents, cable traps are placed along the conductors within the bore to block unwanted currents. This analogy is courtesy of Fraser Rob. In many ways, the addition of cable traps is similar to the damming of a river. Here we see the Mississippi River, where we can imagine the different states are coil elements, and the Gulf of Mexico is the system ground. You can attempt to slow the river down, but it keeps flowing. In principle, you can have 2,000 to 3,000 volts from one end of a conductor to its other end when it's placed in a body coil. This would be generating super high currents unless balins are applied. A commercial 64 channel coil would sometimes have more than 100 of these traps to cover all the cabling. Now this is the model of a coaxial cable. The signal current in the inner conductor is compensated by current in the inner shield to form the desired differential signal. This is the signal that we use to receive the MR signal. Now the outside of this shield is isolated since RF doesn't penetrate conductors. So common mode currents can freely flow on the shield. Similarly to the tuning circuitry, cable traps use a resonant tank to create high impedance on the shield of a coax. This can be done by coiling the coax as an inductor and attaching a capacitor in series. Fortunately, the differential signal is not affected, but the common mode current sees a high impedance and is blocked. The most common cable traps are the solenoid baling that you've seen, or a floating shielded trap, which inductively couples to the cable. Unfortunately, since these are resonant structures, they are very sensitive to geometry changes and hence are rigid, heavy, and impede the flexibility of the entire system. So you can have a very flexible coil, but with very inflexible cables. Now this is the work from our group. 
We've been working over the past three years on flexible cable trap solutions. The idea is to use small toroidal structures that are made resonance via twisted pair trans uh, transmission line, similar to how coils are made resonance. Toroids are self resonance and, the only, and only weakly interact with each other, but they couple nicely to the cable. Therefore, we can cover the entire cable with these uh, traps, thus providing high impedance everywhere while maintaining flexibility. You can see the difference between a system cable with traps and our traps. We call them caterpillar traps due to their appearance. Fortunately, these caterpillar traps are very RF hungry and can block RF much better than discrete traps. In the figure below, you can see a B1 measurement experiment in which a B1 map under a coiled cable is collected. The system cable exhibits some B1 distortion which means that currents are not completely blocked, while the B1 is unchanged with our traps. Since cables are a nightmare to deal with, we would be better off being without them and just go wireless. The dream would be to have comfortable, close-fitting, flexible, and wireless coils. But wireless coils are challenging. They require power, digital acquisition and transmission, as well as synchronization. This work is from Greg Scott and, Greg Scott and John Pauly, where they have demonstrated key pieces to making wireless coils. This includes wireless power, wireless synchronization, wireless detuning circuitry, and data transmission using a millimeter wave digital link. The missing part so far is miniature on-coil digitization, but on-coil digitization has been already demonstrated by the ETH group. So all the pieces for making a wireless system are there just waiting for integration. In summary, implementing flexible coil poses challenges, safety and performance. There are though there are new technologies, flexible, stretchable substrate or conductors and new components, um, geometry, coupling, resilient matching, miniaturized interfaces, which include small preamps, traps, and on-coil LEDCs, which may allow wireless and optical communication. Thank you very much for listening.